So, you want to save the world with clean energy? Make money doing it? Confused about the economic and technical realities of residential and commercial solar, batteries, heat pumps, EVs? Want the real-world scoop on new energy technologies, not manufacture hype? Then tune in to the Weekly Energy Show, hosted by Barry Cinnamon. Insights from Barry's 40-plus years in the solar and energy industry will help you understand the future ways we'll generate and consume energy. And now, here's Barry. All right, welcome to this week's Energy Show. Now, on this show, we're talking about how great energy policies are made. Things like energy deregulation, solar investment tax credit, the California Solar Initiative, Energy Star Appliances, Title 24. Now, but I hate to let you down. These great energy policies don't magically spring from the brains of our politicians. There's a lot of analysis and legal arm wrestling and straight out lobbying that goes into these good energy policies. So there's a few companies that specialize in this type type of analysis that's required to put together good policies. One of the best policy companies is Cross Border Energy, based in Berkeley. They provide clients with strategic advice, economic analysis, and expert testimony on market and regulatory issues in the natural gas and electric industries. And it's my pleasure to have Tom Beach, Principal Consultant of Cross Border Energy, as a guest on this week's show. Tom's been influential on many of California's groundbreaking energy policies, things like the restructuring of the state's gas and electric industries, the addition of new natural gas pipelines and storage capacity, renewable energy development, and a wide range of issues concerning California's large independent power community. I also had a pleasure of working with Tom on the economic analysis for the California Solar Initiative many years ago. So welcome to the show, Tom. Nice to be here, Barry. Good to see you. All right. Great, great. Good to be here on a a nice sunny day. So anyway, tell me a little bit more about the kind of consulting work that Cross Border Energy does. Well, I think you gave a very nice summary there. I mean, we have a lot of expertise in how utility rates are designed. And so we have a lot of clients who have interests in in how utility rates are established in not just California, but other states as well. We also have expertise in policies concerning renewable generation and policies like net metering. And, you know, net metering certainly is an example of a policy where it's an intersection between solar development and utility rate setting. So we have uh, kind of carved out a, a lot of expertise on uh, net metering and have participated on net metering issues in about 25 different states now over the last uh, decade. So that that's certainly been a focus of, of our work. But other than that, you know, we're kind of a small consulting firm. I sometimes refer to myself as an energy private investigator, and whoever comes in the door with a energy-related problem, we're we're happy to think about helping them out. Well, you know, you talk about net metering. That's arguably the most important policy that spurred the growth of the solar industry uh, over the past 25 years or so. And it's instrumental, and it's still really kicking butt here in California. You kind of look at the other countries around the world that tried feed-in tariffs and other kinds of incentives, and net metering just kind of plugs along as being the most efficient, at least in my view, way of incentivizing solar customers. Yeah, I I would agree. Net metering has had an amazing longevity. I think that the real reason is that it's simple and customers intuitively understand, and it, it makes sense to customers, just the simple idea of running your meter backwards and getting credit for the excess energy that you send out to the grid in that very simple way. So it's it's very easy for customers to understand. And, it, you know, what I end up doing is running the economics of net metering, which turned out to be surprisingly complicated. But even when you crunch the numbers, it turns out that in most states, it's rough justice. It's it's roughly the right price for the electricity that uh, customers uh, turn to the grid. Yeah, it makes total sense. And we kind of went through that with the California Solar Initiative. So tell us a little bit about what support you did for that CSI California Solar Initiative program does 10 years ago or so. Yeah, when uh, California got the idea of you know doing a, a long-term solar incentive program, there was the question of, well, is this going to be a good deal for ratepayers? Is this going to be a, a cost-effective program? So we provided some analysis on behalf of the solar industry into the California Public Utilities Commission's proceeding that kind of investigated whether that kind of program would be cost-effective. And 
what we did was, uh, you know, California has had a very lengthy track record of supporting energy efficiency, you know, getting people to put in more efficient appliances and improving the efficiency of buildings. And they've had a, a process for energy efficiency for figuring out if programs are cost effective for a long time. They really have done a lot of work on the analysis to show that energy efficiency, which energy efficiency programs are the most cost effective. And when the CSI was being planned in 2004, 2005, they had the California Public Utilities Commission had just come out with a new tool for analyzing energy efficiency cost effectiveness that was a very granular model. It was it had hourly it, it valued energy efficiency measures on an hourly basis for 8,760 hours a year, and you know we realized that that tool was perfect for solar because you know, obviously one of the complexities of solar is that the production will vary every hour of the year. So you need a tool like that to analyze the cost effectiveness of solar. So we, for the analysis that we did back then is we brought this tool over from the energy efficiency sphere and we used it to analyze the benefits that consumers and ratepayers in California would realize from this large scale multi-year incentive program. Yeah, and I, I remember that some of the biggest benefits were the reduction in the transmission and the distribution costs that you're able to achieve by putting the solar on the roof of the building that's using it rather than putting the solar you know far away in the desert you got to build high you know high voltage power lines and then local distributions so what were some of the numbers that you came up with if you have them that talk about those savings on uh, T and D transmission and distribution costs yeah those are actually still I think that at least in, in California, it has been recognized that those are very important benefits of distributed generation like rooftop solar. We're still arguing about the size of those benefits and probably because it is a very complex area. And, and it's also an area where in the past, you know, the utilities have had all the information on their transmission and distribution systems. And it has not been the kind of information that's been, you know, widely available to outside groups and it's taken a while to get them to to make more of that information on their transmission and distribution systems public but we have made a lot of progress and today i think ballpark you're going to see something like probably 4 to 7 cents per kilowatt hour of benefits from reducing the utility's need to build new high voltage and lower voltage transmission and distribution systems as a result of customers producing their own power at their homes and also you know many of the same benefits also apply from energy efficiency you know with people putting in more insulation or more efficient air conditioners uh, things like that so and i think that we're realizing is Perhaps the larger source of benefits is from the transmission side, the high voltage wires that were in some of the early analysis kind of ignored. Yeah. But those really, for example, the California Independent System Operator that runs the grid in California earlier this year announced that they were taking $2.6 billion of future transmission projects out of their 10-year transmission plan as no longer needed because of energy efficiency and rooftop solar. Wow. Wow. And that's a very large amount of money yeah. that ratepayers are saving as a result of you know, the actions that you know, yeah. everyday consumers are taking. Yeah. Now, I remember you know, a dozen years ago on the CSI program, you know, we were looking at savings you know, 5 to $10 billion over the course of the program by removing, by eliminating all that extra investment. It's complicated also because it's a little bit of a zero-sum game. The utilities really want to build that infrastructure. They really want to build the transmission and distribution equipment because they get a, a rate of return on it. Yeah. <laughs> and they're, uh, they're going to fight like cats and dogs to make sure that they keep that asset and not let customers put the generating systems on the roof. Yeah, that is certainly probably the major source of the tension in the, the debates about net metering and, and rooftop solar. You know, my perspective on it is that as we're seeing in California, I think that California has realized that in order to get to our greenhouse gas goals of, a, you know, an 80 percent reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, we're really going to need to electrify large segments of the economy. And that means electric vehicles, you know, taking over from the oil industry. It means electrifying our buildings, you know, electric hot water and space heating. 
And that is a huge business opportunity for the utility yeah, they, industry. They got to put in new wires for every building. It's amazing. Exactly. It's, and really, we really shouldn't be fighting because the way things are headed, the pie is just getting bigger. Yeah. And there should be slices for everybody. There should be slices for the rooftop solar industry and slices for the utility industry yeah. and slices for the large scale yeah. power producers. But, you know, sometimes that gets lost in the squabbling. Well, you know, I just see that, you know, people want the whole pie or really big pieces of the pie instead of crumbs. So they fight over it. Okay. So uh, we talked a lot about solar. What about um, uh, the, this cost shift that people talk about? There's a cost shift from solar customers to non-solar customers. Um, or is it really just a profit squeeze at the utilities where they just want to keep raising their rates so that they can maintain their guaranteed profits? Kind of what's the in- inside story there or your perspective? Because you're so diplomatic. <laughs> Well, um, you know, we, we, we've looked at, at uh, the economics of net metering, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, in about 25 different states. And, you know, we, we have, you really have to get to a, a very significant penetration of solar before, uh, in my view, you get to, to having significant cost shifting concerns. And you, you need to get to, you know, something like Hawaii, where you have 20 percent of the population uh, with solar on their roof. Um, there you, you do start to encounter, you know, um, potential problems on the distribution system with it being able to handle that much solar. And so let me, let me interrupt you there. So the problems on the distribution system are that you know, the voltages aren't right or something like that. Why don't the utilities just put in, you know, more control equipment to address that? Well, you know, that is what they're doing, but it, it, it can start to, you know, incur some costs. Yeah. To, to solve that issue. But that is a lot of solar. And we are hopefully heading in that direction in California. But, you know, it's still under 10 percent in California and, and other states like Arizona you know, also have you know strong solar markets and, and are heading in that direction. But I think that net metering has has proven pretty resilient up until you get to, you know, a really high penetration situation. And there are some ways to address the cost shift concern without getting rid of net metering. For example, what California did with its net metering 2.0 program a couple of years ago is to require everybody who net meters to be on a time of use rate, which is a, a more cost based rate. It, it more closely aligns with what the utilities costs are throughout the day. And, you know, that's that's helpful in preventing cost shifts. And it's it's a more accurate and sends a better price signals to the customer to do the right thing as yeah. well. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, because we recommend to our customers to go on the EV rate, which is the best time of use rate. It's 45 cents a kilowatt hour the, during, I think, 3 to 9 p.m. The sun's not shining too much then. But in the morning, when you got a lot of sun in the afternoon, it's 25 cents a kilowatt hour. So if you are on an ordinary net metering system, you'll get reimbursed at 25 cents, but you're still going to be buying power at 45 cents in the afternoon and evening. So the solution to that is a battery. And that's why a lot of customers are putting it in. And, and the battery kind of cures the fact that you lose some economics with this time of use rate that shifted to the afternoon, because then you charge your battery up in the morning. And then I look at every single one of our customers with a battery and afternoon it starts discharging and they, they've got their solar power into the evening until the battery dies and you know re- repeats the cycle the next day. Yeah, no, no batteries are really the the next big thing and and I, I kind of think that once they become really economical they will I'm I'm hopeful that they will really help lay to rest the cost shift issue because they turn, you know, what has always been considered to be an intermittent renewable resource into a resource that really acts like a power plant and, and that can discharge its power into the grid exactly when it's needed. You just program the battery to discharge. California's heading towards a 4 p.m. to 9 p.m. peak period, and you just set your battery up to, to discharge when the power is most valuable and when the system needs it the most. And that really is going to be quite a game changer. It also, you know, if your homeowner can provide you with a, an assured source of backup power when you have, when bad weather takes the grid down or, you know, a tree limb falls on the wires in your neighborhood, you know, you'll have electricity when your neighbors won't. So, to, you know, the anecdotes that I've experienced in Silicon Valley over the last 18 months, I've had five blackouts. One was from a tree falling down on the main wires and the power was out for four days. The other four were from transformers blowing up. 
And I remember, you know, one hot, sunny Sunday afternoon, the power was out for 12 hours because everybody's running in their air conditioner, which wasn't planned because they, they added it. And then a lot of people have EVs. So the, the utility, PG&E, doesn't proactively replace those transformers. They blow out, and then you're without a power for 12 to you know, 24 hours. And, and it's an emotional want that a lot of people want. They're, they're saying, hey, the payback on the battery, 7 to 10 years based on the net metering time you use shifts and battery lasts 10 years, it's marginal. But they just say emotionally, I want that backup power. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to have to stop watching TV or heck, I don't want to be able to drive my EV if the power goes out. And it's a big benefit. And those of us who live in the the sort of urban wildland interface where the fire concerns have become uh, especially front and center in the last few years. And, you know, the utilities are talking about turning the, the grid off at certain times. Oh. And that's another potential reason that you may need to have backup power at your house in the future. And, and of course, we live, you know, in earthquake country and if we ever get a big one, then we really will need it, yeah, uh, yeah. but perhaps for an extended period of right. time. And a gas generator, if it's natural gas, the natural gas is going to be out. If it's gasoline, I mean, you look, see what happened in Puerto Rico and Florida and, and Texas last year that, you know, you might have 20 gallons of gas sitting around in, the, in your gas tank or your garage you may power the generator for a day or two. But if your power's out for two weeks, what are you going to do? And then the great thing about a solar backup system is every morning when the sun comes up, that battery recharges. It's going to work almost indefinitely. So tell us a little bit about your experience with rooftop solar. You put a system in in 2003, and how's it performing over the, over the last 15 yeah, years? Yeah, I was... I think I was one of your first customers. <laughs> <laughs> I remember you very specifically. We did a detailed economic analysis. You wanted to go on the time of use rate. Your bill was really low. And I tried to talk you out of solar because I said, you know, Tom, you're going to have like a 12 or 15 year payback. And you sure you want to do this? And I was like, yeah, 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 I want to do it. So happily installed it for you. So, you know, it's worked out very well. You know, the system has been running for 15 years without a hiccup. I think the panels and the inverter have been fabulous. You know, the the only issue that we've had is that uh, I had it hooked up to a computer to monitor it. And after 15 years, the computer gave out. But in terms of producing electricity, it's been, uh, you know, it's been fabulous. Yeah. And we've actually measured the degradation over 15 years. The output's gone down at, at about 0.4% per year, which is a little bit less than kind of the standard half a percent a year that is sort of the industry standard assumption for solar degradation. So that's been right in line with expectations. And I think we actually had kind of an interesting thing. We had our the record year was actually in 2013 when the system was 10 years old because that was during the drought. And, you know, it turns out that the output is inversely correlated to the amount of rainfall in San Francisco. And, and we, have, we have our highest production during the drought years and the lowest production during the wet years. Wow, that's interesting. And, you know, if I recall, I think you had Kyocera panels and they're cranking along. And that, that SMA Sunny Boy inverter was a classic and that's cranking along. Um, but the dilemma that you have right now is I think the SMA software was probably DOS-based and go find another DOS computer. So the monitoring is a challenge. Yeah. It, it, it does seem like we, we haven't quite figured that out yet, but we'll get that working. All right. All right. So are you looking to expand or change your system? Is it meeting your needs as far as the energy that you need in the house? Yeah. You know, we've I think that, as you mentioned, we're you know, we've been on a time of use rate for 15 years, too. I think that's actually the biggest thing that I've learned personally is that it's not hard to make the time of use rate work. Now, we, we live in Berkeley, so it's a coastal climate, and we, we only just added air conditioning to our house this year, so we haven't had air conditioning. But it's been, in terms of running the appliances and doing all of that stuff off-peak has been remarkably easy. And we've actually gotten to a zero bill just about every year, even though the system only produces about two-thirds of the power that we use. And that's just... Because, you know, we produce during the on-peak period and, and get credit for it at a, at a high rate. And then we use most of our electricity at nights and on weekends at a very low rate. So we can get to a zero bill, even though we only produce about two thirds of the power that we use. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that's that's what's great about net metering because you're running the meter backwards at a higher rate. Are you on Marin Clean Energy or Alameda? We are now on, okay. Marin, on, Marin. on Marin Clean Energy, yes. 
So they'll, they, I think they reimburse you if you have a, a credit over a certain amount at the end of the year. Yeah, we just, our community just converted to them this year. So I don't have much experience under that, but their rates are very similar to PG&E's. Yeah, yeah. Now I'm, I'm hearing a lot of good things about all of these uh, community choice aggregation plans, including the one in San Jose and uh, the one uh, in Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley Clean Energy. So, all right, your experiences are great. It's happy to hear, uh, you know, a happy long-term customer and, and looking at somebody who's going to probably expand the system when you get an EV and things like that. So, but regarding cross-border energy, how can people get in touch with you and, and you know, what kind of consulting are, are you looking to expand to? Well, as I mentioned, we do consulting on technical issues that are related to public policy issues. Um, and, you know, we do... Um, you know, expert witness testimony for uh, clients who have business before the California Public Utilities Commission or commissions in other states. Um, we, uh, if you have a, a, a solar project that has uh, issues, public policy issues that you need technical assistance on, um, we've we've done that kind of work. Um, and like I said, we're you know, if you have a, we recently did a survey of electric vehicle charging costs in California for the auto industry. So we've. We like to do sort of cutting edge, interesting work, whatever comes in the door. Yeah, there's plenty of that. What's the website at Cross Border Energy? Well, you can reach us. You can reach me at Tom B at crossborderenergy dot com is probably the best way to, all right, to reach us. All right. Well, great, great. Uh, that's all the time we have on this week's Energy Show. And thanks, Tom, for joining us uh, on the show today. Great insights. And thanks to all of our listeners for tuning in. If you missed any of today's show, you can always go to our website at cinnamon dot energy and listen to the podcast. So, you want to save the world with clean energy? Make money doing it? Confused about the economic and technical realities of residential and commercial solar, batteries, heat pumps, EVs? Want the real-world scoop on new energy technologies, not manufacture hype? Then tune in to the Weekly Energy Show, hosted by Barry Cinnamon. Insights from Barry's 40-plus years in the solar and energy industry will help you understand the future ways we'll generate and consume energy. And now, here's Barry.